Hello, my name is Dr. Melem and I would like to talk to you about bedwetting and how to cure it. When you think about it, bedwetting is not an illness or a disease. We all start life as bedwetters and we all learn to become dry. It is a skill which we acquire in the same way we acquire the skill to talk, walk, ride a bicycle, swim, etc. It is a natural process. Sometime after the age of 18 months, children learn to become dry naturally. By the age of five, 90% of children are naturally dry. By the age of 10, 95% of the children. And by the age of 13, 98% of children are naturally dry. 2% unfortunately remain wetting into adulthood. So the old phrase, don't worry, they'll grow out of it, has got a lot of truth in it. The problem is, if you have a child who is wet in the bed, you don't know whether he's going to be lucky the, within the 15% chance of becoming dry per year, every, uh, every year, or one of the unlucky ones who could be wetting into adulthood. So it is important to take bedwetting as a serious problem which deserves to be treated and sorted. When you think about, um, if you have a, a child who is um, wetting the bed, it is obviously a problem. And basically it is two problems. One for the child, because it's socially unacceptable to wet the bed. And one for mum, who has the burden of having to change the bed, wash the sheets, and then so on. So really it is two problems. And mum looks at problem purely from her point of view, and her main concern is to have a dry bed in the morning. So she will do anything she could think of to achieve that end. And the most common things are stopping the child from drinking, so restricting fluid intake. Lifting the child, so mum before she goes to bed, she carries the child while they're asleep, takes them to the toilet and empties the bladder. So it's lifting them before she goes to bed to empty the bladder. Also using nappies and pull-ups, obviously protecting the bed as well. None of these things do any good for the child at all. If they achieve anything, they achieve a dry bed and please mum, but they are not anything which will help the child become or speed up the process of becoming naturally dry. And uh, one of the very common things, if you, if you ask a mum who has got a child to wet the bed, very often they tell you uh, he or she is um, lazy, they don't wake up, they sleep heavily they are, uh, and so on. And really there is no scientific link at all between deep sleep and bedwetting. Bedwetting takes place throughout sleep, throughout all stages of sleep, not, particularly, not specifically during deep sleep. And the thing to bear in mind is 80% um, of children, when they are sleeping at home, will not wake up to a fire alarm. So the thing to bear in mind is that when a child is, at home, is sleeping at home, it is a safe, secure environment. They know that their parents are looking after things. They don't have to worry about locking the, the house, answering the phone, or doing anything. So when they sleep, they sleep very, very soundly. Mum never tries to wake up the child who, is wet, who doesn't wet the bed. She always tries to wake up the child who wets the bed. So she associates the difficulty in waking up the child with bedwetting. In fact, if she tries to wake up a child who doesn't wet the bed, she will find it just as difficult to wake up the dry child. So it is interesting um, point and um, worth bearing in mind um, when, when, when using the alarms. So basically, as I said earlier, bedwetting is not an illness, it's not a disease, it's a natural process it's an, it, and becoming dry is a skill which we acquire. And the problem is, as I said, uh, you have 15% chance of becoming naturally dry per year, but you don't know when you are going to be dry. And obviously, especially in today's um, um, sort of societies, when mum is working as well, the burden of having to wash the sheets and, and, and change the bed is not, um, it's, it's quite a burden, financially as well as uh, physically. 
and and uh, uh, having a child who, who uh, I mean, there is a risk as well of a child not doing very well at school or being teased and so on if they found, if, if found out. So it is obviously a very serious problem which deserves to be taken seriously. When it comes to uh, dealing with bedwetting, obviously um, the, the, there are two ways of dealing with it. You can, uh, the, uh, you can use drugs and basically there are two uh, classes of, of, of two types of drugs. One is an antidepressant which has got one of its side effects that stops the bladder from contracting. So you are superficially appearing to be dry because the bladder is not contracting. And the other type is the antidiuretic hormone, which you could imagine if you take high enough dose of that, you will stop producing urine. So both of these drugs are basically trying to deal with the symptoms or trying to remove the symptoms, but not deal with the problem. In a way, they are manage you're trying to manage the problem, not to cure it. And this word management is being used now to mislead people, and it is really admission that they are managing the problem or trying to manage the problem so if anything they reduce the quantity and frequency of the wetting but do not cure bedwetting and the minute you stop using the drug the chances are the child would wet again and it is especially in today's financial environment it is worth bearing in mind the cost of drugs as some of them are as much as 40 pounds per month every month until the child is naturally dry, that is if you are taking single dose. If you start taking double and triple dose, as you are advised, then the chances are you are going to spend thousands of pounds on drugs without actually achieving proper dryness. The bedwetting alarm, which is basically... <clears throat> bedwetting alarms have been used for over 100 years. And they initially were used to detect adults in a mental institution when they are wet, so they, they could be changed and prevent bed sores and, and, and pressure sores. To their surprise, the, the, uh, the patients who were using the alarms became dry. So that is the birth of, uh, of bedwetting alarms as such. And you can imagine there were um, sort of military style metal boxes with wire mesh, um, you know, so they were uncomfortable. Uh, and, and quite complicated and, and, and difficult to set up and, and, and have uh, chances of sort of false alarms and so on. The modern alarm is completely different. It um, basically consists of a, a battery operated uh, buzzer attached to a sensor which will detect urine. So basically that's what the alarm, what the alarm is, is actually a urine um, alarm clock, urine triggered alarm clock. And they are battery operated. We have been making alarms, we have invented the body worn alarm, and we've been making aneurysis alarms for over 30 years. In fact, we have set the standard for the modern aneurysis alarms. And the, as you can see, we have a, a large variety of alarms. Clinically, they are all just as effective, they all work, they all work in the same way, and they're all clinically just as effective. The, the different colors are different sounds, some with vibration, some with multi-sounds, um, some you could record the message on them or music or, or a phrase. So really the, the, the variation is to suit the user, but clinically they, work, they all work just in exactly the same way.